how do I create the, the base learning experience? Given what I have today, how do I create that base learning experience? That's our foundation. That's where we start. But then how do I improve the content and the technologies that I'm using that help to move that learning experience forward, to help it make it more engaging and to deliver better learning for my students, right? How do I do that? We really want to be the answer. We want to be what, like when, when a professor asks that question of how do I make my course better, we want them to turn to blend up. Let's discover the Cleveland entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are telling the stories of its entrepreneurs and those supporting them. Welcome to the Lay of the Land podcast, where we are exploring what people are building in Cleveland. I'm your host, Jeffrey Stern, and today I had the absolute pleasure of speaking with David Boone. David is a Cleveland native who recently boomerang back to Cleveland from Seattle to found and, and grow his company BlendEd, which recently closed on over 1 million in funding from Jumpstart here in Cleveland and leading education technology investors like Reach Capital and others. BlendEd is an instructor experience platform, making building and delivering hybrid learning experiences more accessible for instructors. And David himself brings his experience leading data teams at Microsoft and is currently building a team of mission-driven innovators to grow BlendEd. David experienced firsthand the discrepancies in available resources of college instructors between Ivy League schools and community colleges, which account for 0.4% and 46% of U.S. undergraduates, respectively. So he set out to create an all-in-one solution for multimodal digital resources with a very specific focus on community colleges. Based here in Cleveland, the company will be launching in the spring semester of 2022 with Lorain County and Wake Technical Community Colleges. I know I've said this a few times, but this genuinely is one of my favorite conversations so far, hearing David's story and the work he's doing with Blended. We are very lucky to have him back here in Cleveland, and I look forward to collaborating with him going forward. I hope you all enjoy my conversation with David Boone. I, I would love if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your entrepreneurial journey. Kind of take us through it from, from the beginning. Yeah, that sounds good. First, thanks, Jeffrey, for having me on the show. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is David Boone. I am a Cleveland native, born and raised, grew up on the east side for a long time. <laughs> I would say most of my um, <laughs> educational experience, I was someone who was very bright, labeled as gifted, but oftentimes did not live up to its potential, especially in middle school. I had a bunch of trouble with honestly just paying attention and being a good student. I thought homework was a conspiracy and it wasn't until adulthood Which that maybe I realized. It is. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm still not convinced, but in adulthood, I realized I was just bored. Um, I was bored with learning. You know, I got really fortunate that I got into a high school that, that still exists today called MC Square STEM High School. And I was in the first graduating class there. It is a public school focused on science, technology, engineering, and math. And it was the first time I was doing project-based learning. And that's when I kind of knew that I had a knack for, you know, understanding systems, building systems, fixing systems, and sort of got the, the sort of uh, engineering bug. But in that, what I, I sort of always told people is that I like engineering because it's problem solving, but not in the way that sort of scientists solve problems where there's like infinite time, infinite money infinite resource, right? Engineers are like, we have duct tape, bubble gum, maybe a paper clip, and we need to make this thing fly, right? It's like very real world. And so I got obsessed with just learning how to solve problems in that way. And that kind of led me to be wanting to be an entrepreneur because after sort of getting a, a taste of studying computer science, working as a software engineer, I realized that, you know, solving the, the minute technical details was like fun and interesting, but what was more interesting was how those technical details even came to be, right? And so while I was interning at Microsoft, 
I sort of said to them, hey, look, it's really cool that I get to work on hard problems and real products, but who decides what's a problem, right? And I asked them that question. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, it comes from this department. It comes from that department. I said, well, I want to go work with them because that's where like the the genesis of all the problems at Microsoft starts. And that landed me in data science and and later on working on the e-learning platform. And in all of that, again, it was just how do I solve problems, right? With the resources that are available, how do I take on problems? And I just... I decided that entrepreneurship was the way to do that uh, in a way that could scale, right? And, and, and like I said, I had the, the pleasure and the privilege of working on really hard problems on really great products like Windows and Office and so forth. And that was cool, but it, it didn't quite fulfill me in the sense that, you know, they were just like these minute technical problems. Where should this button be? How should this feature work? But you know, I was like, is, is this going to help, you know, someone do their job better or, or change workflows? And, and it just wasn't that big for me. So entrepreneurship became my way to solve problems that were bigger. When you balance problems and entrepreneurship coming out of the Microsoft experience, was it really like, I want to do entrepreneurship in search of a problem or I have a problem and I want to solve it by building something myself? Yeah, that that's actually um, a good point. The whole time I was at Microsoft, and I think sometimes my managers were very, very aware of this. I was looking for my way out. Like it was like <laughs> I was like, "Hey, look, I'm gonna come here. I'm doing an exceptional job because I want to get paid well. But don't be under any illusions that I'm gonna stick around forever because I'm not." <laughs> um, and I think that when it came to starting Blend Ed, and we'll get to sort of how that came to be, it was a matter of wanting to solve a problem in a particular space and knowing that the time just couldn't be better to be operating in a space. And so I knew for many years that I wanted to start a company. I think after my second internship at Microsoft, I kind of decided, I was like, you know, this is great. I need to come here and make some money. You know, I grew up pretty, you know, humble, let's say. And so, you know, it'd be nice to, to not have to worry financially for a period. But once I get to that point, it is my duty <laughs> to, to get out of here and go after something that I think to be bigger. Yeah. So, so tell us about the space that you chose to focus on and, and, you know, what was kind of the, the founding insight that, that you had for, for what Blended has become. So, you know, the way Blended sort of came to be is, is intricate, but, but quite simple. I was working at Microsoft and, and the last uh, project that I was on was an e-learning platform where the, the, pitch was that anyone in the world who wants to learn how to code should be able to, right? There's enough content in the world to teach anyone how to code. The problem is they're not great learning paths. And so we, you know, we're trying to create this assessment driven platform where we could aggregate a learning path with all the content across various sources for someone to learn. So if you are someone who has a math degree and just wants to like transition, then like, you know, here's some very technical, tactical things that you can do. Or if you're someone who like has a GED and like doesn't know, you know, calculus or advanced math or any of these concepts of, of how to model things or the language needs to change. And so here's some materials that will help you to understand that language so that you can then learn how to code. And while working on that, I mean, I really enjoyed it. And, and honestly, it was the one project that could have made me stay at Microsoft. But Microsoft did me a favor and it killed the project, right? <laughs> <laughs> so when they killed the project, I was like, well, hey, you know, I, I sort of stayed here thinking that I found something worth working on and, and that changed. So what am I going to do next? And so at that point, I decided to join a startup to learn more about startups and, and how they work, while at the same time, just investigating spaces and, you know, really feeling a strong pull to the e-learning space, but feeling a strong pull to the ed technology space, but not really tied to it just yet. And then what, something happened that all of us will remember, March of 2020, every school in the country said, don't come <laughs> back. <laughs> and yeah. all of a sudden, you know, at every level in our educational system, you know, educators are being faced with really difficult transitions, right? Going from being subject matter experts to having to be technical wizards. And so I spent some time in that semester while still working at that startup working with educators, K through 16, learning about their problems, trying to see what was, you know, the most difficult about this transition. And I learned a couple of things. The, the one thing I learned is that this transition has been in 
effect <laughs> has been happening, but at a very, very slow rate for decades, especially in higher education, right? The, the push to learning management systems has taken professors a long time to, to uptake. And particularly in K-12, there's more movement, but there's also a lot of churn on tools. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But it wasn't that this was a new, entirely new thing. It was just that now it was not optional. It wasn't just for the sum. It was like, hey, everyone needs to figure this out. And so, you know, that gave me some insight about, okay, well, if this is something that's been there and, and folks still haven't really adopted it, you know, how do we make it so that it's worth adopting? How do we make it easier to adopt? And so that was part of the insight. The other part of the insight centered around the actual experience of curating, right? Because for a professor, particularly because that's the space that we occupy with, with Blended, and I'll tell you more about it. But for a professor, you know, so long, you just went and you picked a textbook. And that textbook came with a bunch of auxiliary things. It came with a digital homework uh, platform. It came with an exam and proctoring system. All of that sort of came for free to you as a professor. And then you had your students going out spending 300 bucks to get, <laughs> to get licenses to these things. And, and in seeing that, we realized that, you know, that model of the textbook in itself is not necessarily, the business model isn't broken. It's just the, the asset is dated, right? Like the business model of, hey, you know, how the students pay for it isn't broken. I think what's broken about it is that the supply chain makes it so that this thing has to be way more expensive than what the actual material is worth, right? Because like most of the stuff can be found somewhere else, but the professor chooses this textbook because they need the digital assessments, they need the, the quizzes and so forth. And that's why they go with it. And so the other insight was, how do we empower these educators to modernize their courses while also bringing the cost of materials down for students? And, and that became sort of a problem to solve and sort of helped us to think about a vision for our company where we're helping professors to modernize their, modernize their courses by helping them to integrate all the great technologies that are available, but we're also helping them to integrate really great digital learning materials that again, bring down the cost for students. So instead of going out and spending a hundred plus dollars on a textbook for each course, you can get access to a library of really rich digital materials that we've licensed from some of the great online course providers, you know, and that's what we've been working on. It's, it's a course authoring solution. Uh, we call it an instructor experience platform where we focus on helping the professors to move their courses into the 21st century. And that includes integrating technology, content and resources that help to make a more engaging digital learning experience for courses that are taught at colleges. And I think that's one of the things that we have to make very clear is we say, well, how's that different in Coursera or some other places? We're all about the actual experience of going on campus and meeting people, right? We're not saying that this online thing completely replaces in person. We're saying that they need to coexist. And so how do we help educators um, facilitate that happening in real time? So it's a pretty ambitious problem space that you're working in and trying to solve. Like when you were starting this idea, you were having those conversations with you know the professors and and the, the folks involved on the ground, what was the idea for the MVP for what you could try and like first validate? How did you even approach trying to solution in this space? <laughs> this is one of those things where um, I wish I had this like you know it just went smooth. We we were so focused, we were so dedicated. We made a bunch of of errors in our initial sort of uh, <laughs> you know, deployment in the sense of we did try to do too much. So we do have this grand vision for the future where we're able to bring really engaging content to a professor as they're building a course and say, hey, look, your students will love this. You know, you should give it a try, right? Um, and have that be, again, a, a transaction that they're comfortable with because it's so low cost for students. Well, there's a lot that goes into, even though we get rid of the supply chain of producing that content, there's a lot that goes into licensing that content, getting it from someplace else, or, you know, sort of protecting the rights around it. And we started to investigate that and very quickly we were able to, to sort of start to focus on what we would do first. And really what we decided to do first is to help professors with the courses they already have, with the content that they already have, right? And so it was this idea of, you know, a lot of professors made the shift 
due to COVID, right? And now they're using their learning management system. But if you talk to the students, the majority of them didn't make that shift very elegantly, right? And so mm -hmm. you ended up with this situation where 70% of students were saying that, you know, they hated it <laughs> after the first semester, right? That they were struggling. And when you look at the leading indicators, it indicated that most of them, it was simply because professors didn't organize the course well in the learning management system. And so what we've decided to do is to focus on that flow in particular. You bring your existing syllabus to Blended and you convert it into a Blended syllabus. And what Blended does on the background is automatically build an easy to navigate course inside a learning management system for you. And so in the case of a professor who is not that comfortable with the learning management system or simply not that comfortable with teaching online, we're able to take what they have existing so they're not starting from scratch and just make it a little bit easier for their students to interact with. And so that's the problem that, that we focus on today. That's what the product is really doing. And that's what we've been able to use to sign on some early adopters as well to get some community colleges in Ohio as well as down in North Carolina to look at uh, us as a solution to a problem they know they have. They've seen it in their course reviews every semester, like this professor, like, disorganized. I can't ever find my homework. I can't, I don't know how to navigate the course. We're looking to solve that problem. And, and in solving that, we hope to, you know, demonstrate to these professors that uh, we create value for them, right? And I think that that is how we can move the needle on some of the more ambitious parts of our plan. Yeah, just, just diving a little deeper on that. I'd love to understand, like, when you ingest the curriculum from the professor and, and translate it, you know, what, what is it that you're actually doing in the background to make it easier and facilitate that, that transition? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I like to just say to people, we are, you know, word, <laughs> but for syllabi, right? Like the whole idea is that we, you know, are a specialized tool for this workflow that looks and feels like something you're comfortable with. And so for a professor who already has a syllabus, they're able to just copy in the, the things that they have, but they're doing so in our structured format, right? And in doing that in our structured format, we're able to then leverage it to build a course. And so to be very specific, you know, you know dive in deeper, when you have to build a course inside of Canvas, every assignment is a separate page, right? And so if you have five essays, three quizzes, and two, you know, exams, right? Then what is that? Eight, test 10 different assignment pages that you have to produce. Most professors just upload the assignment, don't put anything else on there, no instructions, no directions, because it's too much to manage, right? We take care of making sure that that context lands up inside of the learning management system for them, in addition to uploading that file on their behalf. Same thing for anything else, the homepage, right? Making sure the homepage links to all of those other pages so that for the student, when it comes to the homepage of your course, they not only see your name and, and the course description and the course objectives, the this, this stuff that's standardly there, but also they can click in and go to week two, week three, week four, and not have to dig around in the LMS native menus to try and find that stuff. Again, these are all of the patterns that we saw in the feedback from students on courses consistently, which is that professors used it like it was some sort of file system, but then they didn't even have folders. And so it was just like mess of files and I'm supposed to figure out where things are and what they belong to. And so what we do is we just, we, we take care of that for you. And when we talk to professors about why they don't do that, they dread it, you know? The professors, that's, the ones that we talk to is like, hey, do you think you do this well? They would say, yeah, I think I do it well. And I actually have course reviews, I say I do it well, and I ask them, well, how long does it take you? They say, I lock myself in my office for two weeks to get this stuff right. <laughs> That's a lot of time. Um, and we're talking about a, an industry where we, we heard it before, but these folks aren't getting paid very much either. And so, you know, this additional prep time is really hard to motivate someone to take those extra steps, but we know it has such a huge impact on the student performance and student attainment. From a, a business perspective, how is it that you've kind of taken this idea and it sounds like you have some pilots and some traction, but how are you thinking about who is the customer here? How, how does that whole process work? We think of the customer as being the, the professor. And again, you know, we call ourselves the instructor experience platform, right? That's a, a new term. There's learner experience platforms, there's learning management systems, um, but who focuses on the instructor? And that's really where Blended slots in. And so in that, you know, there are a lot of 
different things for us to figure out. But the one other key word beyond instructor is platform. And so the way that we look at what we're building is it really is a platform that, you know, multiple businesses can can live on top of. And so, you know, I talk about this content story and how we can license content. I think there's a story around how we can uh, leverage, you know, distributed content, like now distributed licensing for technologies too, right? And so you think about in the case of a professor that wants to leverage a particular student engagement platform or discussion board, right? Right now, oftentimes they have to wait until their institution decides to make that purchase, right? They can't just decide, hey, I'm going to use this in my course. And the, the flip side of that is the institution needs to make sure there's a critical mass of professors that want it before they'll make the purchase. And so you end up in a scenario where oftentimes professors don't have the autonomy over how their course is delivered that they'd want, right? But we can actually give some of that autonomy back. Again, we talk about connecting them with great content. We can also connect them with great technology and say, hey, look, you want to use a student engagement platform? We've worked out a deal with this company because they won't have to come out and sell to your college, which, which costs them tons of money, which is why they have to charge your college six figures to, to deploy. Instead, they're going to be able to distribute via a student fee to you directly. And so that, you know, scenario is another one, right? And, and really, again, what it goes back to is how do we make the experience for the professor as, as quick and painless as possible? In doing that, what do what opportunities do we open up, right? And so from a business perspective, you know, signing on these pilots, that's the story we're sharing. We're saying, hey, look, Right now, the way that all of this works is broken and you know it. Right. <laughs> and, hmm. and tr when we talk to these folks, they agree. You know, they say, look, we we go out, we make these decisions and then our faculty are pissed off at us because that's not what they wanted. But it was a decision that we had to make through some process or whatever. We want our faculty to be empowered to build great courses. And, and really, it's hard for us to do that. Right. When when you have a thousand plus faculty members, 70 percent of them being part time or adjunct. So. Let's kind of like fill in the the timeline here a bit and and mm -hmm. working towards the current state of of blended. Like how what what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's been it's been quite quite the journey. You know, I quit my job in May of 2020. So like I said, sort of as COVID happened, I started working with educators just learning about their problems. And it was in May where I had to kind of, you know pull my girl, then girlfriend, now fiance to the side and say, hey, babe, I, I know this is going to sound crazy. Uh, <laughs> I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, but I really want to quit my job and work on something cool. <laughs> and uh, and fortunately, she she was very supportive. And in that, you know, I sort of just said, hey, I need five months. I won't make any money for five months. And if I can't figure out how to make some money doing this in five months, then I'll go back and get a job. That was the deal. And in that five months, what I did was just like start on talking to more prof professors specifically in the higher education space. Because again, I was talking K-16 uh, through then, just focusing on a, in a professor space and started to understand their problems and understand sort of like the, the intricacies of what they were dealing with. And in July is when we sort of said, all right, we have a good sense of this. Let's focus on this syllabus building flow. And at that point, we were going to be Zapier for uh, professors, right? We we're going to connect mm -hmm. people to connect, automate connecting uh, services together so that professors didn't have to deal with all of these different services. That was sort of our pitch then. And things, you know, evolved as we learned more. And, you know, we dug in with professors. We created a small, you know, sort of minimal viable products. They weren't even really products. They were just like mini experiences, right? Like I was just like kind of hacking away in my uh, house in, in Cleveland. And so, you know, that kind of became, you know, the way that we started to learn and evolve. But it was probably a about the same time in July when I sort of started reaching out to some friends of mine, some mentors of mine in the business space. And, you know, on one of those first calls, I was just sort of uh, reaching out to, to Laura Butler, who, are, who was a VP at Microsoft, was one of the very first engineers at Microsoft and, you know, is a very good friend of mine. And I just said, hey, Laura, I'm working on this thing. And I, and I sort of wanted to hear your thoughts about how we should go forward with this. And, you know, should we raise or whatever? Not expecting much, just honestly, getting some some advice and she said well you know i have a twenty five thousand dollar check that i wanted to write to some company this year do you want it and it was like sure <laughs> i mean <laughs> i can't turn out money i don't know what it takes to take your money so I, I need to work on some things formalize a company and so forth but but we'd love to to have you involved 
And that was the first angel check. And I was, again, I wasn't looking to raise any money. I think I just kind of was fortunate in that I had someone who believed in me enough, even when it was early stages, when we didn't really know what we were doing, who said, hey, I'll, I'll write you a check to kind of help you get this thing going. And then, you know, a few checks started coming in that way until we raised it about, you know, $230,000 from different angels in Cleveland and in Seattle, where I'd been working before. You know, I think we have a couple from New York, right? It was just sort of all over the place. And what we did was we took that money to build what would then become the MVP that we showed to these community colleges that was able to get us these pilot relationships and help us to sort of move things along. In that same time frame of raising that 230, we also, you know, did a pre-accelerator in Cleveland called G-Beta. And what they really helped us to do is just like, you know, a lot of those formal things that I had no idea what to do, first time founder. <laughs> um, G-Beta helped to, you know, explain them out and and make sure that we had all of our um, paperwork, you know, sort of the way that it needed to be, as well as create a pitch deck, right? Because again, these first checks, I was fortunate in the sense that like, I didn't even have a pitch deck because I wasn't trying to raise money, right? It was sort of of, hey, I need some help. And thankfully, I got you know the money and I got advice and I got help. So it was like the best of both worlds. But you know that became sort of what G-Beta was able to do. And coming out of G-Beta, we also ended up doing an equity-based accelerator. And that was ERA uh, in, in New York City. Um, it was all remote. Again, we, we started a COVID company. I tell people <laughs> like, you know, building Blended has been like that middle school uh, business simulation project that we had to do, right? Because it's like... <laughs> Half the people that I work with, I've actually never sat in a room with, right? They could be a bot. Who knows? Um, we may be in the matrix. Um, so, but, you know, to, to get to, to make a long story short, we did a ERA. And at that point, I sort of, you know, it was like founder school. I mean, it, the learning just accelerated in terms of just like all things and how startups function and work. But then also what was nice about doing ERA is it was sort of getting the company out of the Cleveland bubble a little bit, um, which I think was really helpful uh, because I think that, you know, one of the, the things about starting a company in Cleveland is that they're just really strong major players who have their way of doing things and their opinions, and they don't necessarily reflect how the rest of the world works. And sometimes I think that they can get in the way of, of a founder or, or just a business person generally being able to build the most creative and robust solutions to their problems because they're trying to fit within a model that may not make sense for their business, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that there was a little bit of that in the early days of Blended and, and you know, doing ERA sort of helped us to, to break the mold a bit on maybe how we would have uh, progressed had we just, you know, sort of stuck to the Cleveland market. Yeah. And since then, um, you know, getting to today after ERA, we we focused on, again, serving these pilot customers, um, really strengthening the relationships there, getting ready for launch in the spring and raising a pre-seed round. And so um, we've been able to secure about a million dollars in additional funding in addition to the to the friends and family uh, round that we were able to raise last year. And that's really going towards, you know, beefing up the product development, right? Taking it to a point where we are able to say, hey, we have product market fit, right? We see some some good headroom here and, and we're, we just need some more gas to accelerate beyond that product market fit. Today, I would say we're pre-product product market fit, right? We have a story um, and that story is resonating with customers. But until we have more users using a product, I, I would say that we we have a lot more work to do in that regard. And that's what we're focused on right now. Yeah, and it's an exciting development so far, yeah. for sure. So in, in this present moment, you know, tell us about some of these pilots you're working on and, and how it's kind of where the rubber hits the road how it's going <laughs> yeah yeah i mean we were ch we've been chatting you know over the last couple of weeks and, and just anyone <laughs> i talked to i'm like now the real work begins right yes yes it took me a couple i'll, I'll share this for for all founders that's listening or people thinking about becoming a founder i am someone who naturally gravitate towards being the, the pitcher right to, to pitch to business and, and sort of um provide the story but I also um, am, am technical, right? And my background is is really in product and building solutions. I mean, going back to how I got into entrepreneurship to begin with, I like finding solutions to problems. It's hard to to do both of those things at the same time, 
and and the reason for that and, and someone likened it to sort of like the telescope versus the microscope right which is when you're dealing with you know investors you're really kind of telescope here's the moon right here's here's what we're heading towards this <laughs> is going to be this magical place but when you're working with y- your team you really have to be focused on what is the now and really making sure the team stays focused you have again limited time limited resources right duct tape bubble gum paper clip and somehow you need to get to the moon that's the situation and so since raising the money, I think the first thing I had to do was, is get back to microscope, right? Get back to scrappy engineering, problem solving brain. And since doing that, you know, really what, what we are most focused on right now is just getting to our first hundred syllabi, right? And that's sort of the um, internally what's guiding us is, you know, we want to onboard our first hundred syllabi so that we can learn from that experience from professors. And the way that we're doing it, and this is an offer to anyone listening who is a professor, (laughs) uh, is we're offering a, a, a TA as a service, right? Which is, we will help you onboard your syllabus and we will help you to design your course in exchange for you piloting our product and helping us to learn over the next semester. It's a completely free service. Uh, That's the advantage of raising a little bit of money uh, is that you can do those things that maybe won't be scalable in the future. But the the real ambition here is, again, to, to get more engagement with the product so that we can learn how to make it better. That's one of the big problems is just how to get people engaged, even with these pilot programs, getting administration to be happy and excited doesn't necessarily mean that faculty want to join and sign on, right? There's still work, there's still marketing, there's still efforts um, that we need to work through. And then in addition to that, improving the product, right? Uh, You know, I, I mentioned this before, but when we started building, we were just like building small experiences, right? And and sort of where the product is today is a bunch of those small experiences cobbled together to look like it's a <laughs> cohesive experience. We need to actually make it more cohesive. And so that's, you know, sort of the the other piece of all of this is just like really focusing a product team on making sure that there's zero friction for uh, someone who, who wants to use Blendette, who wants to build a better course for their students, right? Who wants to, to make sure that their um, digital learning experience is, is A1 um, and can compete with the best of them. So you, you mentioned earlier this transition to digital learning in this post COVID world we, we find ourselves in was really kind of always happening. It's really just been accelerated as a consequence of that. Have you found that there is increased competition in the space or like are a lot of people thinking about these kinds of problems now in a way they weren't before and just kind of your perspective on how you are thinking about competition or like what the competition even is? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a space, honestly, that was already pretty crowded. And and I would say that there are some major players that everyone can sort of like, you know, if they think back to their experience, particularly people who are in school recently, they can like, oh, yeah, of course, that company exists. Right. So the the instructor, which makes Canvas or Blackboard, which I think just went through a big merger. Moodle is another that that folks are aware of. They're, They're really big players in that space. And that's, you know, you know, really the the area of serving campuses. But then there's all of these big movers that are outside of serving campuses, right? Like the folks like Coursera and Udemy and edX. And they're like, you know, screw campus. <laughs> you can learn <laughs> anything you need to right here online, right? Um, you can do it from, from the comfort of your own home and your fuzzy slippers, right? That's, you know, also been happening over the last decade. And so there's always been, you know, this crowded market for what does the future Future look like and how do we basically accelerate to that future? What I would say in terms of how we think about this space is, you know, I think that this online learning push, this sort of self-service model, I want to learn a specific thing or I want to transition. I'm already in a career and I want to transition. All of those things are really important and I'm glad that they exist. So Coursera is, is you know, in a good example of like, hey, I am a software engineer. I want to become a product manager. I'll take a Coursera course and then that will be enough for me to move internally. And then once I move internally, I have the title for a while, I can hop out to a different company and do that career. It services that market extremely well. But what about the people who don't have a career yet, right? Like, and I think that that is where we still have a very compelling solution 
in community colleges, specifically community colleges, right? Now, can they be performing better? Absolutely. But they service a, a, a segment of the market that's different than that. I'm a career hopper or, you know, I just want to make a small transition or I want to learn something to be better at the job that I already have. I think that's really where these MOOCs and so forth have been most effective. And, and I think that they should continue to exist for those reasons. But what we see from students saying, like what they're sharing, right, is that they like the connectedness of a course, right? They like the connectedness of a course that has real people in a real space, right? You know, when when we look at the data, you know, students are saying that they want more blended experiences where there's still this digital component because they also love the value of the content, right? It's nice to be able to have a simulation to understand physics versus trying to understand it from drawings that your professor who can't draw <laughs> has put together right so so they like that but they also want to be in class every once in a while and that's why even in Coursera's latest report they're saying that 85 percent of colleges plan to increase blended learning experiences right the ones where there is both online and in person and, and that's again coming from the folks who are saying do away <laughs> with the classroom yeah, yeah. Is, it's just not the direction that educators that students are interested in like the, the students really have voted for this more blended future where they can still have that learning from each other and the collaboration but also have the really rich experiences that online and digital have to offer uh, and so that's where we slot in we say for every professor who you know wants to be a part of this future right wants to be able to teach in this new paradigm we want to be the platform that helps you to do that we want to help you make those blended courses that you're institution without question is going to ask you to produce in the next five years because all of them have said that that's a, a part of their new mission i'm going to ask you to take back out the telescope for a sec here and put the <laughs> microscope away but when you think about you know what the moon right like mm -hmm. what what is the broader vision that that you have for the company and, and the impact that you hope to to make with it Absolutely. You know, fortunately, I haven't been able to put the telescope completely away. It's not too deep in the closet because, <laughs> I mean, it, it, one thing is, is helpful is for motivating your team. Now, what I tell people, uh, and, and this is really what, what, why in May of 2020, I just, I felt this nagging urge to leave my job is that I want to change learning for all learners in all learning environments. I am extremely fortunate, right? And, and people will mix up when I say fortunate because my background doesn't seem fortunate, you know, given that, you know, homeless to Harvard, the whole story that came with, you know, me getting into Harvard, but to have attended an institution like Harvard, I am extremely fortunate because all of my professors had incredible support staff around them, every last one of them. When I started working in this space, I went and spoke to some of my professors at Harvard and said, hey, look, I'm thinking about this space and I'm hearing all these trends. And they said, oh, yeah, everything you're talking about, 100 percent, those are really tough problems. But here's the thing. I take those problems and I put them into a job description for my head TA because that's <laughs> how I solve that problem. And so, you know, there's the, this very small set of institutions where, you know, money's not an issue, support is not an issue, and they can build really incredible learning experiences. But that small set of institutions services less than a percent of the general population who are in an undergraduate program across the country, right? Community colleges service 40% of undergraduates, 40%. None of them have TAs, right? Even at the best community colleges, none of them have the support to make their course rich and flexible and so forth. And so my big vision is that our platform becomes that support, right? The things that it, they don't have the time, they don't have the resource, the things that are just hard, right? Fundamentally difficult, right? To, to, to do and then teach, right? To do and then deliver incredible learning experiences, our platform is able to do. There's a long list of things. And so we have to prioritize <laughs> what those things are, right? But a, a big part of them, you know, again, it, it goes back to how do I create the, the base learning experience? Given what I have today, how do I create that base learning experience? That's our foundation. That's where we start. But then how do I improve the content and the technologies that I'm using that help to move that learning experience forward, to help it make it more engaging and to deliver better learning for my students, right? How do I do that? 
we really want to be the answer. We want to be what, like when, when a professor asks that question of how do I make my course better? We want them to turn to blend up. Mm. What are the things that are keeping you up at night these days? Oh man. (laughs) So many things, but let me just think about last night. What was I thinking about last (laughs) night? (laughs) Cause it changes, man. This is a high pace, high energy, you know, position to be in. And and I'm excited about it. I love it. The things that, that really keep me up right now is again, we have these great deals with the administrators at these institutions and I am really excited about them. And, and like, I sort of look at them as like, you know, we have permission, but I also know that we need to get to a point where we don't need their permission to do the work that we think is important. And, and so what keeps me up at night right now is how do we move away from the partnership model? Not to say that the partnerships aren't important and that we won't pursue them, but how do we make it so that any professor that wants to make their course better can, right? Like that's the thing that like, if we can figure that out, if we can get to a point where, you know, we don't need to, to go through the IT department to get, you know, situated with their LMS provider. Any, we, if we don't need to do any of that stuff, then we've created something that I think can really expand beyond these partnerships into classrooms we haven't even thought about yet, right? I think that, you know, there's value for for really any educator who, again, just like wants to create a, a consistent, easy to use experience for their students. And right now we just, we, we can't service all of them and I want to be able to. So that's what's keeping me up. Well, I know one of the things that may have been keeping you up before was, was getting through this kind of funding process. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> good to be yeah. done with that. <laughs> it's good to be, yeah. What tell, tell for, us for about now. <laughs> the, 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 that whole experience and the struggles and learnings, yeah. you know, everyone wants to see more than you have, no matter how much you have. That's what I'm learning. Cause I have, I've now made friends who are in all stages of their company. And unless you have some like breakaway company like Facebook, right. Where like, you know, investors are literally crawling over each other to invest in your company. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, oh, you have revenue. That's great. But why aren't you at this amount of revenue? Oh, you have adoption. That's great. Why aren't you at this level of adoption? Oh, you have, you know, <laughs> MOUs. That's great. Why don't you have more MOUs or more LOIs, right? There's always this, you know, more, 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 more. And I get it, right? I get it to the extent that you just want to make sure you're investing in the best deals possible. But it also makes it really hard for someone to to get started, to get to that point. Um, Because, and and even then, it makes them hard to, it makes it hard to know what point they need to be at. If the target is always kind of moving, uh, you know, what, what, what do you actually need from me? Uh, you know, don't don't be nice and tell me, oh, if you just have this, you know, we'll invest. Like, because if I get that, I want to come back to you and say, hey, I have this now. Will you invest? And you go, oh, no, no, no I meant it this way. Or it was just a, there's this. I think there's a disconnect between what's actually good for the business, what what's proof uh, of things working, versus you know what sort of becomes vanity things that that investors want to see. And I think in my experience, I ran into a few folks who are kind of vanity vanity chasers. I also know that, you know, I'm in a segment of the market where folks aren't really that excited to write checks. I mean, the number of funds that, you know, even some that were like, hey, we're focused on black and diverse founders that are mission driven and they have this whole spiel. Right. And I come in and say, hey, look, I'm David Boone. Uh, I've boomeranged back to Cleveland to start a company and provide high tech jobs in my region. And that's, you know, you can see their ears sort of perk up then. And I say, and it's an education technology company. And you're like, oh, we don't do ed tech. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> uh, okay. So can I tell you why I'm doing ed tech? Because that's part of my mission too, right? And nah, I just don't do it. And so, you know, I think that was another factor in, in raising this capital is, it, is, you know, it's not insure tech, it's not fintech, it's not any of the hot items. You think ed tech would be high after the year we've had, but like much later stage deals. Even the ed tech investors that I spoke with, they were very clear, They're like our bar for a pre-seed and a seed round is higher than most pre-seed and seed funds in other sectors. And some of it is just driven by, you know, knowing the market, knowing how tough it is to crack, but, you know, and and I appreciate that, but also the market shifts and it evolves and it changes. And so, you know, 
<laughs> you still got to take bets. And so I'm extremely fortunate that, you know, I was able to get an ed tech investor who knows the space really well to, to sign on this year as a, you know, in this pre seed round and as a mentor and sort of helping it, me to figure out what the next steps are with Blend Ed with Reach Capital, because I think that completely changed how the fundraising, you know, happened from there, right? Their endorsement helped me to close some of those angels that were just on the fence, right? That that maybe you were going to write a check. It also helped me to get the, the last fund, um, you know, that the sort of investing this round to, to finally say yes and, and make that move. Yeah, this everyone all comes in at once. It seems to always be the <laughs> no one wants to be first, but they don't want to be last either. That is what I'm finding, That's, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So you we know. were, you know, we were talking about catch twenty twos before we we turned on the mic here, and I I think that resonates a lot. It, it, there's a lot of catch twenty twos building a company and bringing people together through these, yeah, and just trying to figure it out it, things. Right. To, to take, you know, something from idea to, to, to a business that has, you know, revenue and, and a sustainable business model is hard work. Um, and so, you know, it, we, I get why people want to make sure they get back the right people and in the right spaces. But yeah, there, there's challenges when you pick a space that people are kind of like, nah, I'm okay. <laughs> I'll pass. <laughs> yeah. So I want to tie it back to, to Cleveland uh, as we kind of work towards the, the end of our conversation here. But you're you are here in Cleveland and and you're you're building yeah. a company here. And that's like you didn't have to do it here. And yeah, I made an active choice not to go back to Seattle, right? To stay right here in Cleveland and and build. Yeah. So maybe we can just expand upon that a little. Tell, tell yeah. me a little bit more. I, here here's here's, you know, two reasons why. Uh, and there are others. I have this good friend, Robert Jackson, who when I was maybe a sophomore in college gave me some really great perspective. And I mean, this guy's, let's call him eclectic, but I love him to death. But one of the things he said that really resonated with me and I haven't been able to let it go is that it is our job to venture out into the world, learn what we can, but it is also our job to bring it back to the nest. And so I've been stuck with that since he said it. And I mean, we say it to each other all the time now, right? When we talk, um, bring it back to the nest. And he's since moved back to Houston where he's from. He's doing incredible work there. And so it was my turn, right? It was my turn to say, hey, look, I believe uh, in my city. I believe in its potential um, and its capacity. Even when the rest of the world, you know, thinks us uh, second tier, I know that we're first rate. And I want to demonstrate that by building a company that, you know, stands the test of time, that creates opportunity for people right here in my city, right? And so in that, I, when it was a question of Seattle versus Cleveland, I just had to sort of <laughs> at least give it a try, right? It was like I, I couldn't <laughs> abandon the thought because it, it is something that really means a lot to me as a part of my mission. The other thing, and I know you always ask people about hidden gems, you know, I, I actually, and I say this to you all the time, I think one of the hidden gems about Cleveland is that there is capital in Cleveland. And, and in particular, I would call out, you know, Jumpstart as a hidden gem. They were the first institution to invest in Blend Ed, right? They, they um, created a validation fund, basically, and they wrote us a $100,000 check, pre-product, pre-MOUs, LOIs. That went a very long way <laughs> to making a lot of what we've accomplished since possible, right? If we didn't have that hundred grand, we wouldn't have been able to hire the engineers that we hired to be able to build that for those first experiences that we've now cobbled together to something that you know has led to the MOUs and those MOUs have allowed us to raise more capital, right? The flywheel um, in a lot of ways started with Jumpstart, and you know that doesn't mean Jumpstart can't be better. <laughs> I am someone who after interacting with Jumpstart, really, I just, I think, you know, people give them a hard time, but I've, and I've said this to other folks, but at the end of the day, they write checks, right? They've invested more than $65 million, I believe is the number, into the region, and, you know, since their founding. And, you know, very, very few institutions can make a similar statement. And so, you know, as founders, as, as sort of company builders, the two things you need more than anything else <laughs> is like, you know, to be able to hire great people and to not run out of money, right? Like <laughs> those are, if you can do those things, you can 
keep it going until you find that product market fit, until you find that tearaway hockey stick moment that everyone's searching for. But if we didn't have the capital available, we didn't have the, the funds like Jumpstart that were making it possible, you know, this would be a much harder region to be starting a company in. I wouldn't be able to sit up here and say, hey, I made the choice to come to Cleveland and it worked out if it weren't for Jumpstart taking a bet. So I challenge everyone listening to think about how you can help make Jumpstart better, because I heard a lot of people talk about how it could be better. Like, actually, like, let's make it better, right? Let's make it better. Because, you know, for me, it, it's a superpower that we need to figure out how to leverage to the best of our ability as a region, right? And and we need to figure out how we can influence it to be better uh, instead of just, like, complaining and nagging about how it could be better, right? Cleveland's done a lot of coulda, shoulda, wouldas for a long time. <laughs> but it's about time we actually did. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that perspective. I think there's... There's a lot of merit to that. But you, you kind of mentioned the where we're going here at, at the end with, with Hidden Gems. Um, and I'll, I'll push you for, uh, for another one if, if you have one on mind. Hey, you know, this one's going to sound weird because it's not hidden. It's huge if you look at a map. But Lake Erie <laughs> is a hidden gem. I, I mean, I, seriously, I, I have my friends from college come visit. And I took them to um, Euclid Beach, which I don't even think most people would say is their favorite beach to take people to, right? But we do it at the Euclid Park Beach. And they were like, wow, this is nice. The water's warm. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it's not that crowded. Right? It was just like an incredible experience. And these folks are coming in from California. And they were like, I actually kind of like this better. And so, you know, I think, you know, when we talk about the region and, and some of the things that, that people will find attractive, I don't, I don't know if we give Erie enough credit for what it offers us in, in all this glory. I, I'm with you there. It's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, David, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story and, and the whole journey so far. It's, it's a, a pretty incredible one and definitely excited to, to have you on and, and that you're building it here in Cleveland. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. I really appreciate you having me and, and just the opportunity to speak to founders and, and business people and just listeners in the region and outside of the region to say that um, Cleveland's a great place, uh, you know, and it has its troubles, but like any region, any place, um, there's always a way. And I think that uh, the more we tell these stories and share them, we empower people to find their way in, in Cleveland. Hmm. Well, if, if folks have anything they would like to, to follow up with you about Blend Ed or Cleveland or otherwise, what, what is the, the best place for them to do so? Yeah, I am um, uh, not quite uh, of the social media age, even though I'm not very old either. <laughs> <laughs> so the best place to reach me, the best way to reach me is to email me at it's david at blendedcourse.com and if you email me there and say hey you heard me on the, the lay the land podcast uh, i'll be more than happy to chat sometime that's all for this week thank you for listening we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show so if you have any feedback please send over an email to jeffrey at layoftheland.fm or find us on twitter at pod lay of the land or at stern jefe j-e-f-e If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please reach out as well and let us know. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast player. Your support goes a long way to help us spread the word and continue to bring the Cleveland founders and builders we love having on the show. We'll be back here next week at the same time to map more of the land. The Lay of the Land podcast was developed in collaboration with The Up Company, LLC. At the time of this recording, unless otherwise indicated, we do not own equity or other financial interests in the company which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.